One of the things that we're going to do as we have this conversation is just uh, reflect on some images that will appear uh, on the screen, the first of which uh, is an image that, uh, that was taken back on the, 20, the 20th of June uh, last year. It's Sam and uh, Candy's wedding day. And this is one of the days where uh, there was much rejoicing, as you could well imagine. Um, it was a day where perhaps many in this room were actually part of that gathering of rejoicing when others were rejoicing. Uh, and if you were to stop the clock right now and you meet Sam at that point in time, you meet him as a young bloke in his mid, let's be generous, 20s, in his mid-20s. He's newly married. Uh, he's fit and healthy. In fact, let's be generous. He's seriously fit and healthy. Uh, he's got a job that he loves and that he's great at. He has a ton of friends. He has a solid faith in God. He has an amazing church, um, well, at least by my own estimation. Um, he has a loving family and he has a list of plans for the future. He also has a long-time affection for motorcycles, a ton of experience, and he's regularly commuting uh, each day to the city uh, by his bike. But he's also got an agreement with his wife, Candy, that where he's able, he's gonna to avoid to ride in wet weather. And so on that afternoon, about seven months after this photo was taken, on Thursday the 14th of January this year, he sees the forecast and that it's clouding in and that rain is due later that afternoon, and so he arranges to leave work early. By 3.15, he's already crossed the Spit Bridge. He's made his way down the Burnt Bay Bypass and he's just about to leave Manly Vale. He's traveling north on Condamine Street in the curbside lane. And as he rides through the intersection with Campbell Parade, a car in the middle lane makes a left-hand turn without indicating and without braking. And that car goes directly into the side of Sam's motorcycle before he even has time to reach for his brakes. He'll travel a further 15 meters or so, separated from his bike, sliding across the tarmac He'll connect with the gutter, and then ultimately his chest will make impact with a traffic pole on the northwest side of that intersection. It is an horrific motorcycle accident. It's on reflection of that experience that afternoon that I realised that Sam experienced for real the horror that's only imagined in that song that years ago was made popular by Baz Luhrmann called The Sunscreen Mix where it says that the real troubles in your life are apt to be things that never crossed your worried mind, the kind that blindside you at 4 p.m. on some idle Tuesday. This was some idle Thursday back January 14th this year, and it blindsided Sam and his family. Today, four months on, incredibly, we get to explore the rest of this story and what God would teach us, and I'm glad we can. And so could you please make welcome Sam Lees, who joins us. Welcome back, Sam. Thank you. Uh, that afternoon, um, whilst you're um, unconscious, a phone call is made from one of the attending police officers. It's a phone call that's made to your parents. And that police, police officer inf informs uh, them that you've been involved in a, in a serious motorcycle accident. And the statement is made to them that uh, you've sustained serious but not life-threatening uh, injuries. Uh, that piece of information gives uh, your mum and dad and Candy and many others that night an incredible sense of hope. Uh, but it wasn't true. Uh, at no stage, in fact, uh, through that afternoon or the rest of the weekend, were you uh, out of harm's way or hadn't sustained life-threatening injuries. And so uh, can you tell us, um, tell us the experience of that afternoon as you've been uh, informed since the accident as to what happened. I know you break this down into kind of three segments, the first of which is the, the injuries that you sustained uh, there, there through the accident. So can you, can you tell us what you endured? Yeah, um, so as Leon said, I was hit uh, by a car and, and uh, flung into a uh, traffic light pole. Um, uh, injuries working from uh, bottom working my way up. I, I broke my pelvis, broke my, a few fingers on my right hand, my right scapula. Um, Working across, did my uh, clavicle on my left side, a grade three. Um, a lot of nerve damage on the left hand side. I broke 18 ribs. Um, I had a flailed chest. Five of my ribs were displaced, uh, which essentially means they've broken into several parts. Um, I tore my aorta from my heart and I lacerated my spleen uh, and my lungs collapsed and I ended up losing about 80% of my blood. Life-threatening injuries. Uh, there's a picture uh, that was taken uh, that first weekend uh, of you in Royal North Shore Intensive Care, and all a photo can ever do is show us those external injuries. And as you've said, the bulk of um, 
the bulk of your injuries were internal. Um, and um, not only those injuries uh, being the, the, those that you endured, there are some that you didn't sustain that day. Um, you, you suffered no damage to your brain uh, and nothing to your lower legs beyond your pelvis. Um, and uh, that is astonishing. Um, and we'll come back and think about that in a moment. Uh, but one of the other things that's um, surprising and miraculous on that afternoon are the events that transpire uh, immediately after your accident, those that attend to you. And so can you talk us through the, the people that uh, cared for you that first day? Mm. So the, the paramedic who picked me up, his name's uh, Nick Nolan. He is uh, now son-in-law. He used to attend this church and he's down the road at Pitwater Uniting. Uh, so they're based at Narrabeen. Uh, and then he got a call out about an hour or two before my accident to Cromer. So he was making his way down the beaches. Uh, then got another call out after that to DY. And it was as he's on his way to that call out there that uh, he then got the call out to come to me. So he was about five minutes away, as opposed to being 10 minutes away. Um, and, and it kind of came down to it, the seconds and minutes mattered in the end. Um, so he arrived. Um, uh, as I said, my lungs had collapsed. And so he needed to uh, essentially hit my lungs with two needles to get them breathing again, uh, to get them going. Um, He's been a paramedic for about 25 odd years, I believe, and uh, he had never once performed that procedure. Uh, two weeks before my accident, he had done a refresher course on how to do it, um, which I was fortunate for. Uh, so, uh, so he took me to the hospital, knew to do that to essentially keep me alive, got me to hospital. Uh, as they were doing that, they called ahead and said, you know, these are the injuries we believe he sustained and, and that we'll need this kind of theater ready to go. Uh, there's a cardiothoracic surgeon who goes by the name of uh, Dr. Brady who uh, was up the road at Royal North Shore Private. I was taken to Royal North Shore Public. Uh, for those who know, it's a few hundred metres away. Uh, he was in between clinics at the time, had it come through and he thought, look, I might see if I can go down and give a hand. So he was there waiting for me along with a number of other surgeons and doctors and nurses. There were about 22, I believe, in all in my theatre at the time of operation. Um, and I got pulled in, and the procedure states that you have to take them for scans um, before uh, doing any kind of operation to them. Uh, he's one of the best in Australia, and he knew that if that happened, that I wouldn't live through the scan. So he grabbed my bed, pulled me into the lift to take me up to surgery, and called out a bunch of people and said, I need you to come with me so we can operate now. Um, when I got into hospital originally, my heartbeat was around 30 or 40. Um, once I got into the lift, my heartbeat hit zero. Uh, and he had to sit there and pump my heart to keep it going, uh, and then got me into theatre and could plug me in. Um, cut me open down the middle, spleen was uh, lacerated and bleeding everywhere, so he clamped that to stop the bleeding. Uh, he then got out, the next surgeon jumped in and removed my spleen. He then got out, next surgeon in, comes in and uh, puts a stent in my aorta, uh, which is about 134 mil long, so 13 odd centimetres, uh, and it goes like that, and essentially for those who aren't aware, I wasn't before either, yet your aorta provides blood to your organs and all your lower limbs, it's the big one, and, and it had torn uh, off, so the stent is a bit like a framework that now sits in there um, permanently, and uh, yeah, once they, that had happened, they then put me into an induced coma for a week. That all sounds simple. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it's not at all, is it? Um, when you think of uh, the events at the roadside, uh, you think of uh, the paramedics attending you, um, there's, uh, there's a slim chance of making it to the hospital. Um, there's a slim chance um, of surviving the surgery. Uh, you do both of those um, things. And um, obviously through all this time, you're, um, you're unconscious. In fact, uh, that, uh, that uh, immediate first aid administers drugs to you that puts you effectively into a coma so that your body doesn't go into a critical shock. And, um, and when you look at uh, what you've endured, uh, all of the injuries, some people will look at you today and say, you are one lucky fellow. Um, and you're a guy who works with numbers all the time. And that explanation of luck doesn't seem to uh, gel with you. Can you tell us mm. why not? Um, yeah, it was uh, a number of weeks after the accident. I found out from my, I've got five or six specialists looking after me now that, um, and they've all kind of told me from their perspective what the chance of survival is based on a number of different injuries that I had. Um, so I said I broke 18 of my ribs and I broke rib number one, which is your top one. Uh, and the chance of survival, if you break that, is less than 10%. 
um, because it essentially either punches your lung or serves your spinal cord. Um, so there's 10% there, or chance of survival less than 10%. Uh, aorta coming from your heart is less than 20%. Um, so you're down at about 2% based on two of the injuries, uh, let alone all the other ones combined, which kind of came to about a sub-1% sub chance of survival at the point of coming into hospital. Um, and that was just the probability of me uh, having a heart that would beat. Uh, that's not the probability of me uh, back at work 10 weeks later, uh, walking around two weeks after the accident. Um, that was just me being alive. Uh, and the fact that I sustained no brain damage and, and nothing to my uh, spine was something that the nurses had never seen before. So if not luck, then why are you alive? Good question. Thanks. I, um, <laughs> yeah, kind of, you know, it's, there are only kind of two outcomes to it. It's either luck or, or another outcome. And I believe the other outcome is that God saved me uh, without a shadow of a doubt because the probability of me li living is so, so, so ridiculously low. And not only living, but being in a state that I am now that is more or less no uh, ongoing issues for the rest of my life. Um, and so, yeah, without a shadow of a doubt, I believe it was God who saved me. Um, but at the same time, I was sure as to what was happening, how did he not save me? And, and that I know this is temporary, that this world is temporary, that, that our home is not here. And, and so I know that uh, had he taken me that day, then you know, that's all good, I'm going home. Um, but, but he didn't take me that day, and so then it begs the question, well, why not? And, and I was talking to my father-in-law about this, and he said, that's awesome that you've been saved, because clearly there's something more that, that's, that's to come from this. And if one person were to become a Christian on account of, of me passing away on that roadside there, then, you know, it's all good, happy days. But if God saved me uh, for more than that, then, then that's even better. Hmm. I remember visiting you in hospital, and I remember that being put to you about that idea of being saved for a purpose. Um, and one of your replies was, um, I had a purpose before the accident, mm -hmm. too. Did I really need to have an accident to, to discover the purpose? <laughs> um, and, um, and there is something astonishing about all of this. And, and it probes big questions. It explains, in, in part, why there's, a, you know, there's been people gathering all day to hear uh, your story. Um, because you mentioned before that th there were three things that have really been kind of miraculous or inexplicable. Partly the stuff, the injuries themselves, as severe as they were, that they weren't more severe into your spine or to your brain. Uh, the, the, those that cared for you and the incredible um, yeah, circumstances around your immediate um, treatment. But then your recovery as well has been something that's astonished people. Um, the the theatre nurse, the IC nurses th that saw you um, anticipated that very few people that come in in your condition ever uh, walk out, um, let alone survive. Most people that sustain motorcycle injuries don't go to, uh, to the ward that you went to. They'll go to, uh, to a spinal unit or to a brain unit. Um, but you're in a cardio, um, cardio unit. Um, and other aspects of your recovery, we're sitting here four months on from the accident. Um, with, can you just talk about the speed at which you recovered and, um, and, and what's life like for you now? Yeah, so it was, um, yes, I was standing again after about seven days, albeit very painfully. Um, after about two weeks, I was walking again with a bit of a walking stick. Um, and, and yeah, I, I since uh, have been to all my specialists. My um, uh, cardiologist, after a scan, said that uh, organ has formed in and around the stent and that was within six weeks. So my body is essentially created another aorta there from where it tore. Uh, he said that can take up to 12 months uh, and that took six weeks. Um, I, I forgot to mention upon coming into hospital and being cut open, the cardiologist looking, uh, my body had actually started to heal the tear already in my aorta, which allowed blood to keep getting pumped um, down to my spleen to then go everywhere else. But, but that kind of healed it enough to keep me alive as well. Um, and yeah, and then like I said, back at work 10 weeks later and with a couple of uh, buggered up shoulders, it'll get better and, and that's about it. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of rehabilitation that's still happening, mm. um, but you've gone back four days, next week probably five days a week to, to, uh, to work. Mm. Um, one of the things that when you woke up from your coma, um, you were first interested in was 
whether or not you'd sustained injuries significant enough that it'd stop a ski trip that was planned for February. Mm. Um, now, just to let you know, he didn't ski in February. But, um, but you have a trip planned into the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To actually just postponed it 12 months. <laughs> which, is, which is astonishing in itself. Um, and and I, I want to return to something that you've already kind of alluded to a bit. One of the things that we've talked about a bit over the last few weeks has been uh, the idea of mortality, the idea that you... you you, you, you may well uh, have, have died, um, and it's given you an awareness of that, but there's this relationship that you've started thinking about between um, your identity and where that's found, your mortality, and the idea about uh, living in a, in a culture of entitlement. And I'm wondering if you could just tease out those ideas and where you've been thinking about that stuff. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I guess the, another part I forgot to touch on was uh, Ten days after the uh, the accident, uh, so the weekend following, I uh, my left lung uh, started to get fluid on it again, um, and and I had to get another drain put in there, um, and uh, nobody actually knows this apart from Candy and and um, Leon, but um, yeah, for about sixteen hours there, uh, I was, it was the most pain I've ever sustained, ever been the most uncomfortable pain that. Uh, if your lungs essentially was collapsing again, um, but I was awake for it this time, um, it, it's, the feeling is such that someone's got a belt tied around your chest and he's pulling it as tight as they can, and then someone's sitting on your chest and suffocating you for 16 hours straight. Um, and I didn't sleep a, a, a single minute that night. I just stayed awake. Uh, I couldn't sleep. I was just stirring the entire time. And it was at that time there that I... Um, uh, yeah, I essentially said to God, I'm over this. I, I said, take me. Um, and, and it was because, yeah, I was pretty over the pain by then. Uh, it was very uncomfortable, just a feeling of continual suffocation. Um, but as well, but I was confident in knowing where I was going. So it, it was like, well, you know, I've done my best, but that's it. Let's go home. And, and so I was, yeah, f he pulled me through it. I, had I known how painful the operation the next day would be, and I probably really would have asked him to take me because that was pretty bad. Um, I won't go into detail there, but I essentially had to shove another tube into my lung to suck out the fluids. Um, so yeah, so that idea of, of yeah, just going home as well was something that has become really fresh for me and, and, and this life and what it's really a, a, you know, about. And I feel that especially amongst my generation, we have this uh, entitlement feel, so we start up here and, and feel we deserve this, and, and therefore anything that isn't this is always lower than it. So I deserve, you know, the house, the car, the relationship, the job, so on and so forth. Whereas I heard a sermon by a fellow called John Piper a few years ago, and he said, no, no, you, you start down here and you go, every single breath that we have is a blessing. Um, and then it just goes up from there. So the fact that I'm alive, um, that's a blessing. Um. So a culture, culture of entitlement, mortality, and, uh, and your identity. W w what about that identity aspect have, uh, have you come to think about through that? Um, yeah, so uh, um, prior to the accident, I found um, my identity all in, uh, in my image and what I looked like and in essentially riding my motorbike was the two things um, yeah, where I found that who I, that's who I was. And when those things were stripped away from me quite literally in a matter of weeks, uh, you kind of then uh, realise that you know, if you've hinged everything on that, then you've got nothing. Uh, and whilst God was there, it wasn't the, you know, my everything um, in, in, in the same sense as what it should have been. Um, and yeah, so those, like I, I lost 10 odd kilos in 12 days time. Don't recommend it as a diet. Um, and, and yeah, and motorbikers unfortunately now gone, um, not out of my own choosing. So, yeah, those two things have gone. And, and Can I stop you for a second at that point? Whilst not at your own choosing, um, just tell us about that process of coming to that decision um, of not riding the motorcycle and why. Oh, an agreement that Candy and I had was that if I come off my bike, that it will go. And I thought this constituted a large enough crash <laughs> to, to warrant it leaving. Um, but it, similar uh, to Stephanie Gilmore, is it, where you know, riding motorbikes is my biggest passion. And, and like she got 
attacked by a shark and straight back out there and wouldn't think anything of it, uh, I would jump back on a motorbike tomorrow and, and be neither here nor there about it. Um, but before my enjoyment, obviously, comes my, my wife's uh, worries and anxiety, and that's the, the last thing I want her to think of every day. So, yeah, that, that constitutes a bit of leaving. Yeah, it's, it is a lovely sacrifice. Um, now, I cut you off. Uh, identity caught in your appearance, mm. in, uh, in your, in your uh, yeah, and then in motorcycles and in other things. Mm. And how has that reshaped? Yeah, when those things aren't there, you think, oh, well, you know, what else is there? And, and like I said, God was always there. Um, and, and by no means was he a, a last glance, but it wasn't where I was finding my identity. And when you realise that nothing else really matters, um, because you have to, I had to rely on him. He was a crutch for so long there that he becomes, um, he becomes everything. And you have open dialogue and conversation. Um, it's frustrating that it took that to have to get to it, but at the same time, uh, uh, you know, if I were to cast mine back four months and you know, to, to know where I am now, I, I, with the exception of the accident, I, everything else, the positive has come out of it, um, which sounds pretty stupid to say that, but I'm now closer to God because of it. And as I said, if on account of that, um, people hear the gospel preached and what he has done in my life, then it's, you know, it's, it's all good. I'll, I'll uh, lose everything else for that. Can you tell us, tell us how it's changed your, or developed your understanding of God? So lots of people will hit uh, a tragic event or come through suffering and they'll, um, they'll approach these things and it will change their view of God. They'll say that God's an absent thing, he was, he's, he's uncaring or he's, he wasn't there and, and they'll push God out of the picture. You've actually embraced God through this period of time. Um, it was a God that you already had embraced prior to your incident but all the more since doing that. And I often think for those who, who reject God through those times, you think you, you're actually not answering the problem of suffering. You're actually, and also you're pushing away one of the, one of the well, the, uh, the ways of actually explaining um, and, and, and uh, uh, enduring through suffering with a God who, who knows and empathises and cares. Uh, others will redefine that picture of God. They'll say that God's not loving or powerful. Um, but there's an arrogance when we want to redefine our model of God. But for you, how has it developed your understanding of God? Yeah, it's, um, yeah we, we, and, any, and everyone goes through suffering. You can, you can take it one of two ways. You can either blame God or, or realise that he isn't the one to blame and that we live in a fallen world and that's why things go wrong. Um, and therefore, if... if uh, you know, I, if I had the option to either sit there and, and wallow in self-pity and say, you know, and blame God and just say this all sucks, then, um, you know, that's, that's, that's not knowing the God that we love and, and what he has actually done for us. You know, Jesus went to the cross and died and he had done nothing wrong, yet he did that freely for, for everyone. Um, and, and so I think of that and I think, well, if he's done this for me, what, what right have I got to go and say it's all your fault that this happened? Um, yeah, I, I, have, I have no right to say that whatsoever. Um, and, and when you have to rely on God so much, and, and yeah, it, it comes down to either going, I can get angry at him and hate him for, for what's happened to me and, and, and feel woe me. It's, you know, why did this happen to me? Why didn't it happen to the guy riding the 100cc scooter um, and... <laughs> Not because people on scooters are more deserving of suffering. Um, yeah, and, and, and I wasn't going to do that because, because, you know, God has done so much for me through this and not just through this but prior in my life. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a child of his so it's all good from there. And see, that's one of the dilemmas, isn't it? That, um, that in this, we're sitting here tonight, and your story for all of the tragedy and the suffering is, is, uh, is miraculous. There's wonderful things to reflect on. And yet there'll be people who will endure suffering and their outcomes don't look uh, like yours, yours do. Um, I was reading, I was pointed in the direction of a, uh, of a book that was written by a guy called Ken Mansfield. He was a record producer um, who was linked up with the Beatles back in the 60s, uh, became a Christian, and he's written a book called The Beatles, The Bible, and Bodega Bay. And um, there's an entry in that 
that, um, that I, was, I came across just yesterday. And um, part of it identifies with exactly this, except the stories um, and the sufferings um, of a different nature. But I just want to read this because it's beautifully written, but it, it, it taps on something interesting about suffering. He writes, I know a man is not supposed to cry, but today I feel like Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. I wept in the wind as I walked before the waves, wondering why Matt died. I gazed out at the sea, knowing that beneath its surface that the sharks and the dolphins swim in the same water. For just once, though, I wish that Flipper could give Jaws a wail of a beating. Mayo was a Christian, Matt, sorry, was a Christian brother and a young father of three small children. A fourth was due in a few weeks. He'd lost his job recently and things were tough on all fronts. He was killed instantly in a tragic motorcycle accident. I honestly believe that some of the tears that I shed were for those last days of, that he had with his family with him. I wish that things could have been better before he went away for the sake of their memories. I never cried when my dad passed away. I kept thinking I would, but now I can't stop crying for Matt. Maybe I'm shedding tears for this father is a symbol of all the fathers when I think about those young children and what they have lost. I fall to my knees at the water's edge and I lift my swollen eyes to the heavens above and I pray. I came to the water's edge for answers after I heard the tragic news today. I've been staring at it for hours and waiting. As the ripples washed up on the sand, I want to rush in and have the whole thing healed to have everyone's pain go away, but I stand transfixed, unable to move in any direction, mentally, physically or spiritually. I refuse to ask God why these things have happened he is God. We got that straight a long time ago. And so I've learned to ask him what and how instead. What am I to learn from this experience? And what can I do that would be in line with his wishes and purposes? How can I bear a godly witness in a situation like this, especially when all the unbelievers have a field day as we crazy Christians try to explain this one away? How can I minister to those in need? How can I glory, glorify God in this and in every situation? And it's that reflection where he's grappling with this question of suffering and why it happens and the tears that flow and you want to eradicate that. But he comes back to think about questions about what and how. What, what can I learn from this and how can I minister in that? And I, that's a question that I'd like you to explore for us. Um, what have you learned and how is it impacting you? Mm. Um, yeah, I've learned to rely on God completely. you uh, when you're completely helpless, lying in bed with pretty much all your ribs broken and can't move, um, you're, you're at a stage there where you go, well, I, I, am, I am nothing, I've got nothing here, and, and yet I have had to completely rely on God. Now, I am much better now. You know, I am, will be pretty much healed in a couple of months' time in terms of my shoulders having um, full flexibility, and well, close enough to full, full flexibility. Um, but. but I have learned from Ryan and God there that then even now as I am getting better to, to still fully rely on him and, and to talk with him and to have conversation with him. And, you know, prayer doesn't have to look like, um, it definitely can, you know, five, ten minutes set aside and it's good to look like that. But as an open dialogue, you know, just walking down the street, driving, whatever it is, just chatting with God. And it might sound foreign um, to, to a lot of you, but... Um, yeah, that's what he calls for and that's what he asks. And so in every situation, I've learned to be thankful from, you know, getting an extra one degree of movement on my shoulder uh, to thank Jesus for that because I know it's not on my own accord that that's happening. Um, even when things have gone pear-shaped, which they have since the accident every now and then, just to go, okay, you know, this is happening, right? What's, what's going to come from it? What am I going to learn from this? I might never see the fruit of it. Um, it might not happen in my lifetime, the fruit from, from anything that happens in our lives, we might not see the fruit from it. Um, but, but we're not called to, it's, it's not about us, it's about God. It's about bringing glory to him. Um, and he's using us to bring glory to him. And that's what he did through my accident, which you know, I'm pretty stoked on that he, he did that for me. Um, and, and that from that, I, I can be a witness to others. Um, yeah, you couldn't, kind of couldn't ask for anything more. Which is, which is an astonishing thought, isn't it, that you, you learn through this. It's one of the things that in, in, in the book of Hebrews where it talks about um, the discipline that a child receives uh, from, from, a, from a loving father that, it, that, that trains and equips and guides in righteousness, that there's a, there's a fruit and a benefit on the, on, the, on the other side. It doesn't explain the, the causal questions about why those things took place. Mm. 
C.S. Lewis talks about that when he talks about the idea that we learn things in our pain that we never learn in our pleasures, that pain operates like God's megaphone, that he whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts to us in our pain. Uh, He's told you things about gratitude and about your independence and about humility and about those things. Your experience of prayer has been a really interesting thing because you're someone that was passionate about prayer prior to your accident, Mm -hmm. but you experienced what it was to have 10,000 people globally, and those numbers are just an estimation. Um, but pretty inaccurate, actually. We think they're on the far lower side of what they actually ought to be. But the experience, the, uh, what it is to have countless people praying for you, um, what did that mean for you? Hmm. Um, yeah, well, Steve came with those numbers and he works in construction, so he probably added 20% on top. <laughs> um, <laughs> 40? Wastage. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, you know, we, we actually did have a conversation about this and worked it out how... You know, who would have been praying for me at the time? And it kind of did get to that number where you go, well, would have actually been something ridiculous in that, uh, you know, my church was praying for me, but then, um, you know, Steve's wife, Jack, she then had her parents in the States praying for me uh, and their church. Uh, Mum and Dad told their friends in the Philippines and they were all praying for me. Uh, and you kind of just keep going on with that. I can think of countless churches here in Sydney and Australia. Uh, Jesse and his parents spoke to last night and they said, how are you going? Our church has been praying for you. So this idea of the global church was praying for me. Uh, and that's what it is. You know, the church isn't bricks and mortar. The church isn't denominations. Church is Christians in a global sense. Uh, this is just somewhere we come to uh, you know, hang out with like-minded people and, and praise God. But you know, the church is so much bigger than just this building that we're in right now. Um, and and it's, a, it's a really difficult um, feeling to explain uh, what it feels like for, to have thousands of people praying for you. Um, it's, it feels like being enveloped, but, but not in a, someone physically hugging you, but just this comfort and, and knowledge that, um, that you are uh, being taken care of um, from your Christian brothers and sisters. And it's really, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult thing to explain. And I, I felt it most when, when the church prayed for me on that Friday night, um, eight odd days after the accident, where I was just lying there in my hospital bed. And I just felt this, uh, like I was cradled, like, like, a, like a child. And it's, it's an amazing feeling. And it got me, uh, when I found out later that the church had prayed for me that night, and, and just the ongoing prayer, and it got me thinking, you know, why don't we do this for everything? Why does it take this kind of situation, someone with a 0.1% chance of living, um, to, to get us praying for one another? Uh, why doesn't it happen for, for the, um, you know, the fellow who's just lost his, his mum or his dad or, or is going through cancer or something like that? Why don't we do it all the time? And it's what we should be doing all the time. Um, uh, or, or asking God for things. Um, yeah, why, why don't we do it? And it got me thinking that if we did do it, imagine what that would look like. You know, I, I'm a living testimony of what it looks like when 10,000 plus people pray. Um, and that's not to say that God's going to answer uh, all the prayers, how we envisage them to be answered. But in everything, he, um, uh, he's going to bring glory to himself. And, and you know, that's all that we can ask for. It might not look like how we think it should. Uh, had have I passed away, then... Uh, God will have received glory through that as well. That's a perfect advertisement for next week, uh, to come and think about what it means to carry one another's burdens um, as we gather and think about prayer in that, in that, um, in that week. Uh, one of the images uh, that's about to pop up on the screen is an image that, um, that I really like um, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, the, I was sent this um, image, and the time that I'd seen you before this, you were in intensive care, and, and I liked it because it was the first indication that, that I'd seen of you up and about. Um, although um, restricted, you're now in a uh, wheelchair. This is at Ron North Shore, uh, a week or so later. And, um, and just the thinking about the, the progress of, of, of your recovery and all of those things. But the thing that um, I think I appreciated about this image the most was the, the, the picture of someone who, um, who was once strong, uh, laid low, um, and now in that point of recovery, I was thinking how... Um, you're a picture for us or an echo of Jesus in the sense of one who, who has uh, great strength uh, laid low 
um, ultimately resurrected. And I was thinking about God's purposes and plans and his capacities and, and, and how, how great a God is. And yet it's through weakness and through suffering that he often shows his glory in most powerful and profound ways. And so being part of that process of suffering and being aware of that, of being uh, invited into that space as we, as we all have been, there's a, there's a blessing of being able to see what God does in that. Um, but it's that idea of suffering with one another that I just want to think and tease out for a moment because perhaps one of the most enduring images um, that all of us have seen has been this next photo of, uh, of you in intensive care being kissed on the forehead by Candy. And I can hardly talk about this image without tears um, welling up at the thought of it. I, um, I remember this day, um, or at least the days either side of it, and, um, and you are unconscious of those. Your memories of this are only from things that you've been told or seen. But for Candy and for your mum and dad and for your in-laws and for a whole collection of friends and family, uh, they lived through this. And so their experience of suffering with you is different. Uh, and I just want you to share with us your thoughts on what it meant to have other people suffering alongside you in a different way, not through the physical. Hmm. Yeah, because I, I didn't suffer through the emotional side of it. As I said, I woke up six odd days later and was just trying to figure out how many weeks till I was off to Japan. And with a cast on my arm, thinking my arm would get better and that's it. Um, so I, I went through the physical side, not the emotional side, whereas my wife and... Um, Yeah, my parents sat there and saw me in a coma and were very much of the understanding that I would die. Um, they weren't given the numbers that we now know, but they were given the injuries, and you only have to Google it to figure out what that actually means. Um, yeah, so they went through something completely different to me. Um, in Yeah, in... In my eyes, they went through much worse than what I did. Um, I, I've fought, uh, very blessed to have never uh, had any nightmares or anything like that from the accident, um, whereas I know that's not the same for them. Um, you know, thinking of what it would look like to, to bury their husband or bury their son. Um, but when you um, have those people beside you in your life, you really have to rely on them in the sense of, um, I lost all my independence, so you really have to rely on, on them um, yeah, being there for you. And yeah, I, the way that they act at that time is, is the way that we as a church should act with one another. Um, and not just one another within the church, but one another outside of the church as well, um, uh, the people in the community. Um, where it is this sense of unconditional love. Um, you know, that's what we're called to be like. And uh, I can speak for myself in saying that I know that I don't act like that all the time and that I should. And, yeah, I, I was a, I'm, yeah, a fiercely independent person and pretty impatient. And when you can't do anything for yourself and getting spoon-fed and getting showered and taken to the bathroom and everything like that, it really... Um, you really need those people in your life uh, uh, to help you. And, and yeah, my wife was beside me every, uh, pretty much every hour of every day. And I was a right old grouch sometimes. Um, and, and never, not once, not once in the entire, in the entire time did she ever, ever get upset uh, or show her the annoyance and frustration at me being angry, not once. Um, yeah, kind of, you know, I saw Christ through her in the way that she was loving me. And that, look at, you know, we kind of got, not quite yet, but first year of marriage out of the way, which is always the hardest, so um, <laughs> definitely push the envelope on that one. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's what it's supposed to look like. And, and uh, my wife and my family and my friends and my church community live that out um, with me uh, every day. Hmm. Um, I didn't relate this this morning, and I hope you don't mind me sharing this, but I did your pre-marriage counselling. And uh, one of your greatest fears, as we talked, um, uh, was 
uh, something happening to you, Sam. Um, and uh, God took you guys to that place. And, uh, and Candy lived through uh, the experience of what was uh, her worst nightmare. And, uh, and from an outsider looking on, uh, to, see, uh, to see God's grace in that time, his sufficiency and his strength uh, in your wife mm. and in your family and all those things uh, is an incredible gift. And uh, it was only just occurring to me now as you were talking that you, you never would have known that without this, um, that it's through that, uh, that trial that you have this incredible collateral, collateral that's grown through that. Um, mm. And it's astonishing that you can say what a good God um, in that space. There's been many things uh, that I've thought about with this, with that idea that there's an enormous cost that comes as we enter into other people's suffering. So there'll be people suffering that you know in your lives right now, or all of us in our room, and the thought of maybe keeping a distance from them because it's hard or awkward or you don't know what to say or the time that might be taken up. This is an invitation to not let others go through those places alone because for what you would gift to them, but also what they gift to you in that space as well, what you receive in that. Um, one of the, un- um, the other surprising things in this, and we're coming close to a close, was um, a Bible verse that meant a lot to your family through this time was Psalm 91. And uh, your dad was, and your parents were keeping people updated regularly uh, with uh, various updates through the day. But this uh, verse came out, went to a number of people. It went to your work colleagues, um, none of whom are Christians. Uh, and uh, they then put together a gift. They took a, uh, an image of uh, the lighthouse at Baron Joey and attach the text of Psalm 91 to it. Can you tell us what, what that meant to you when you received this gift? Yeah, I, um, you know, I, got a, I work with a small team and, and the three of them um, turned up to me in hospital for a few days before I left um, with this gift there. It's a framed photo of, of that. And uh, yeah, I was, pretty, I, was, I was speechless. It's one of, if not the best gift I've ever received. And it's not just because of what thought went into it, but for people who um, uh, don't share the same beliefs as me, uh, to put that together really struck a chord with me. Um, and uh, yeah, it, yeah, it really resonated with me. Um, and the verse itself is such an awesome verse. Uh, I'll cut a few verses there. And it was on my, my wall in hospital the entire time. Um, and it... It's, it's a great verse for all of us to have and to remember. And it might not look like we assume it should look. Uh, it might not mean God rescuing me in a physical sense as to how I, or how we might have prayed for it to have happened, uh, or how we might pray for, for ourselves or for each other in other circumstances. But um, if, if you're a Christian either way, you are rescued because he will either look after you or he will take you home. So, so it's a, in my eyes, a, a win-win. Is he going to keep you here for a reason, or, or you're going, going home? And, and, and in that sense, the, um, yeah, it was really, really powerful uh, for me to have that there, and, and to know that they, my friends at work, read this verse and they saw it, and they uh, would have to have looked at it at some stage. Uh, and their friends that, um, yeah, really close friends of mine, but but probably would never have gone to church in their life. So it's, it, it's an awesome thing that that happened. Mm. Yeah, it's a great passage, and it's an amazing thought to think about that. And it says something about the nature of God, doesn't it, about this one that you could call upon, and he answers. We sang about this before as we sang Oceans, and it's a, we're thinking through this idea of a God who's present in that and at work, and how that story is understood and how people respond to it. And this is close to my last question, second to last. How do you want people to respond mm. to... Uh, what's happened to you over the last four months? Um, well, I'm a pretty black and white person. I work with numbers every single day. So it's, um, I, I kind of, there's really only two responses in, in my mind as to hearing uh, stories like what happened with me. Um, and that's, you can either go, um, it was all, it was all luck. Um, you know, it was pure chance that it happened, um, that the chance of survival being less than 1% let alone all the other things that happened around the accident as well. Um, that's one way you could, could look at it. Or the other way you could believe, well, there's, if it wasn't luck, then it's something else. Uh, and then it's up to you to decide what that something else is. Uh, I believe that something else is God um, and, and Jesus, who was the one who saved me. And, and it doesn't even register with me that it could have been anything else. But 
there's really only two outcomes to it, and, and you can sit in the um, basket of going, um, you know, you were just very, very lucky, and um, and you were that point, whatever it would have been, one percent um, to be alive, or you can go, no, no, there's something more to it, um, and, and that's the idea of Christianity. That's what I love about it is that. Uh, you, you search it, you pursue it, you find out more about it. Um, ask questions. That's that's the idea: is is to find out about it, um, and and find out what is there more to this, or is everything just luck and chance? And you roll the dice, and whatever happens, happens. Uh, I feel that it's a pretty, um, with a view like that, it's pretty uh, inconsiderate of, of those who don't, that it doesn't happen out for them like it did happen for me. You know, what happens to those where they, uh, it, yeah, it doesn't work out for them. And just to go, well, bad luck. You know, it doesn't, doesn't quite seem fair. Whereas if you have um, that, that knowledge and understanding of God and everyone has that ability to understand and learn about him, um, then it would be uh, foolish not to ask the questions. And, and find out more, um, be it just a starting point. You've chosen, uh, even prior to your accident, to praise the God that's made you, that's demonstrated his love for you in Jesus Christ. Um, Timmy V, a few weeks, a few days after your accident, sends you a, a YouTube clip of a song. Um, and it's a song that talks about, uh, through the whole spectrum of what life brings, you'd praise. In a way, it reflects the kind of story that Job tells of, a, of someone who loses everything that the Lord can give and the Lord can take away and that the Lord uh, ultimately is the one to be praised. Um, that song we're going to listen to in a moment, but uh, how did that song minister to you? Yeah, it's, they're, they're pretty powerful lyrics. Um, and essentially it's saying no matter what comes your way, still praise God. And I've heard it said a number of times in sermon. That doesn't mean that, you know, something bad's happening. You go, yes, bring on more. You know, that, that's not the idea. But it's to say, no, no, um, as a foundation of everything is still God and he is still there and he is still loving us regardless of what's going on. And, and the only outcome from it is praising him because of that. Um, yeah, and this song, uh, when Timmy sent it through to me, it was, yeah, it just... It hit me big time because, and I realised I've got, I've got nothing to be upset about in this. You know, I, I, I have life. That's a win from there, and it's just getting better. And, and the fact that not only I have life, but I am, will be back to normal, close enough to, is just nothing but praise. And that's what I, I, I don't, and I never want my story to be a sob story. Or, you know, oh that sucks that you went through that. It, the focus is not me, the focus is God in all of this. The focus is him and glory that comes to him because of what he did through me. It's, it's not about me at all. Um, it should be God reflected through this story. Sure. Sam's asked that you might take a few minutes now and reflect on uh, the song that's about to play. Um, I'm going to ask that you would thank Sam for sharing his story with us tonight. and for. <laughs> again. 